we're in uh, Silly Daniel chapter 11 this week, and uh, we'll conclude it uh, next week. But uh, all began with a, uh, a vision uh, back in chapter 10 where we had what we called a unique uh, messenger come and deliver this message to uh, Daniel. And uh, living there in the Babylonian captivity, uh, he's receiving uh, uh, certainly not the, the first of a prophetic vision, but uh, really the, the second. He's interpreted dreams of uh, Nebuchadnezzar that told about uh, kingdoms and world empires that would come and go through the ages. Uh, but now in the second half of the book, from chapter uh, Daniel on, 9 on, we have the, the visions of Daniel of uh, what will happen uh, in the future. And as we got to chapter 10, uh, really was a message on uh, spiritual warfare because of, there's a delay in the message getting through. And then last week we looked at the uh, fact that uh, Daniel predicted that after the four Persian kings came and went, the Greek kingdom would be established or the Syrian kingdom uh, under what we would he described to be Alexander the Great then described how his kingdom would be divided in fours, which it was through his four generals. Uh, and um, that's kind of where we uh, left off. And of course, he gave uh, many details. We went through 40 uh, very specific prophetic events that would have to happen uh, in sequence for Daniel to be correct. And, and actually, we were lumping some of those together. There were more than 40. We're going to go through some more uh, details this morning as we continue on in verses 21 to 35 and look at uh, really the, the, the last of the uh, Syrian Empire and the, the rule of Antiochus uh, Epiphany. Uh, again, Daniel described very specific events about him coming to power uh, and, and some of the events of his life and, and so forth, and it's uh, uh, amazing. Now, again, I didn't even count on this time. I, I was reading John Wolford, who's a great Bible commentator and uh, really an expert in the area of prophecy, uh, and he has listed them blow by blow and uh, in Daniel chapter 11, there are 135 specific details that are mentioned by Daniel that would have to happen in a sequential order in order for him to be correct. And um, it's just uh, amazing, again, uh, we study prophecy <clears throat> so that we can see the prophecy fulfilled, like we're doing this morning. Next week, in verse 36, at the end of the chapter, we'll see prophecy yet to be fulfilled. We're going to read about things that are yet to happen uh, in the future. Most Bible prophecy is fulfilled prophecy, although obviously uh, there are still uh, things that will happen in the future that we have tremendous uh, details about. And some of those we'll look at uh, in the person of the Antichrist next week, but we'll see that uh, this fellow, Antiochus Epiphany, is certainly what we refer to as a type of the Antichrist, and that's kind of where we'll conclude our, our study uh, this morning. Let's go ahead. I, I wanted to show you just because uh, I had a couple of questions. A picture of the this is the Dead Sea uh, Games where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Uh, we mentioned them last week, and they they play a role in Daniel only to silence the critics of Daniel because no historian denies the accuracy of Daniel. They say yes, it's exactly the way history played out. They just deny when it was written. Daniel was written, that Babylonian captivity, 6th century B.C. Uh, in these caves, and there are 11 of the caves, thousands of documents or portions of documents that were found there, biblical, uh, non-biblical, Jewish writing, writings of the, Quran, of the Quran community that lived just adjacent on the top of the hills there. And, uh, and we mentioned the fact that the, in, in the entire scroll of Isaiah that's found was on display for years at the shrine of the book in Jerusalem, that if you took a Hebrew Bible today, in, in Hebrew letter by letter, you could go right through that scroll. It's exactly the same. We talked about the, uh, how that gave tremendous evidence for uh, the exactness of the transmission of Scripture. If you, again, study in a university somewhere, a secular university, to a community college, to a high school, you'll hear people say remarks like, well, the Bible is full of errors. My goodness, how can you expect somebody to make copy after copy through the centuries and expect it to be, you know, what it was originally? But no, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we can compare, compare manuscripts there that are seven or eight hundred years apart to the Dead Sea Scrolls and find out they match exactly letter for letter for letter. The entire book by Isaiah, but also in the, what was found was the, the book of Daniel. 
And that's uh, helpful to us because the critics say, yeah, we see that it's accurate historically. We just don't believe it was written in the 6th century. But again, beginning with many of the events last year, by the time they, last week that we went through, including including all of the events here, because we're in a time period of about 1, 170 B.C. is when Antigua's Epiphany gained power. We're going to read about that in a moment. Copies of Daniel's manuscript are dated from 200 B.C. on. So by the time these events are happening, there are copies of his manuscript at the Quran community, either in use uh, in the uh, synagogue there, or already stored in clay jars, and, uh, and that's one of the main main themes there. But tremendous discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and validate the transmission of the scripture, its accuracy, and validate Daniel as a, as a true prophet. As believers, we'd say, well, he just said he was a prophet. That's good enough for me. But for people that do, are not believers, uh, that are not Christians, don't believe in the errancy of Scripture, we need these kind of evidence to support uh, our views. Let's go ahead and look at some of the, uh, the details. And, and yes, once again, it's going to be a little bit of a, a history lesson in ancient Syria. Verse 21 to 24, we'll first see the vile king comes to uh, power, and that word is the King James word for him, NIV is contemptible. You'll agree he's pretty vile, but it's going to be talking about some of the things he did in his life. Verse 21, he will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He's talking about the Syrian or the Seleucid uh, Empire, the next king. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully, and with only a few people, he will rise to power. With the richest provinces, uh, when the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He will distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. We'll, we'll stop there. So here, Daniel uh, uh, gives five specifics about this. This king, uh, this vile king coming to power. And the first is, is that, that description. He's contemptible or vile. Second, he will invade uh, the kingdom. Uh, he'll see an overwhelming army swept away. to come to power deceitfully. And he'll invade uh, the richest provinces when they feel uh, secure. And uh, we go on, we'll see that uh, these predictions came to true. And the first one is, uh, again, the vile king is Antiochus uh, Epiphany. And I've got a uh, picture of him on that uh, engraved coin that he had minted. And I'll, I'll make reference to the description on that uh, coin in, uh, in just a moment. But again, uh, Antiochus Epiphany is uh, actually Antio uh, Antiochus IV. He comes to the throne in 175 B.C. Uh, we've already studied a bit about him because in Daniel chapter 8, when we're given the... Uh, the sequence of events of, of world rulers, he's described there as the little horn of, of Daniel chapter uh, 8. Uh, he is called vile or contemptible uh, compared to his predecessor, uh, which was uh, Philip Hatter, not Peter Hatter, but Philip Hatter. Uh, he's called vile because of his immorality, his persecution of the Jewish people, and of his hatred to God. Now, on this coin, he had inscribed Antiochus Theos Epiphany, which means. God who has made himself manifest. So he's one of the first rulers uh, there, what we might call the Western world, to take upon this idea that he is God, uh, come in the flesh and so forth. But certainly he would not be the last because many of the Roman emperors uh, would take that same title from him uh, years after this. Again, as we're, we're about 170, we're going to follow this in sequence to about 130. Uh, the Roman Empire really rises to power in about 30 30 BC, but they're a player in this already. They are on the rise in terms of power. Second thing, certainly he was vile. Did he invade uh, the kingdom? Yeah, he invaded or took over the Assyrian Empire. He was not given the honor of royalty because he wasn't. It really wasn't his position. It's one, as Daniel says, three, that he would take uh, over uh, uh, by intrigue. Excuse me, let's jump and just uh, cover in sequence. Antiochus did see an overwhelming army swept away. Uh, that was in 170 BC. He did uh, invade Egypt and he saw their army swept away. 
Uh, and again, it's a statement that's in general indicative of the conflict that would exist between the Syrian or the, again, the Seleucid Empire and the Egyptian Empire. And of course, every time they fight back and forth, they're passing through, through Israel and uh, through Jerusalem in particular. Uh, again, uh, Ford mentions that Antiochus did see the Prince of the Covenant destroyed, and of course the, the, the people of the Covenant are the, are the Jews, the, uh, they're the, of the Covenant of Abraham, the Prince of the Covenant, and speaking of the High Priest, and by the time he comes to the throne, Antiochus, the High Priest is a guy named Onius III, he is the High Priest serving in Jerusalem at the Temple. Uh, he ends up taking him and disposing of him when he takes over, doesn't kill him right away, just removes him from being high priest, although he is murdered later. Uh, and then he takes his brother, Jason, uh, and makes him the high priest. And he does that because Jason will compromise with him. Jason will uh, allow this idea of more of a Greek influence coming into uh, the culture, into the religious life, and really uh, changing uh, Judaism uh, tremendously. One of the things that's interesting to study uh, this prophecy, it takes us into a part of history that the Bible is silent on to, to a degree. And it's kind of interesting to, to uh, understand what's going on because it's we're in a time period after Malachi, after the Old Testament is done, what we call 400 years of silence before we have the writing of the Gospels and the birth of Jesus and so forth. And a lot of times you wonder, well, what was going on then? Well, this was going on. And, and um, Jesus comes on the scene Judaism has been shaped by Antiochus Epiphany, by Jason, because of the influence of the, of the Greek language, the Greek culture, and the Greek way of viewing the world and thinking. We're going to do the Truth, truth Project on Wednesday nights to try to help us kind of refocus on what really is true and what is false. And as believers, how should we really view the state, uh, civil government? Uh, how do we view uh, the family? How do we view uh, philosophy? How do we view biology and origins? How do we view different areas of our lives? Because we've been, as believers, very influenced by a, another way of thinking. Uh, that's what's going on in Israel under Jason. Onius is disposed. Jason comes uh, to the throne. And, uh, and we'll talk more about his influence there uh, in a moment. But just think about the New Testament. <clears throat> by the time you have the New Testament, you have a reference to the Decapolis. Does that sound real Hebrew to you? Uh, again, that's Greek for the ten cities. Uh, you've got a dispute in the book of Acts because of two groups of Jews, and one of them, uh, these are all uh, believers in Jesus in the book of Acts there, and one of the group is saying, we feel that our widows and our orphans are kind of being cheated and not being cared for, or not, we're being discriminated against by another group of Jews. And we want you, Peter, James, and John, the rulers here, to make some decision about this. Remember that dispute? It was between uh, between the Hellenistic Jews and the Jews that were more Jewish, that were from, uh, from Israel and so forth. You get Hellenistic Jews because of Antiochus Epiphany and because of Jason, the high priest at this time. It had lasting effects. It sets the stage for when Jesus comes on the scene. And of course, they settled this feud by saying, well, we'll put you, we'll take all Hellenistic Jews. You guys are worried about it? We'll put you in charge of all the money and everything, and you can distribute it. Let us know how it goes. Uh, and that kind of ended the, uh, the whole thing uh, there in the book of Acts. But uh, things that are happening now influence all the way into the New Testament. <laughs> Now, why is uh, the one I almost jumped ahead? Because it's interesting. Antiochus did come to power deceitfully. And uh, he did do it in a time when people uh, felt secure. Remember, the previous ruler then, the Assyrian ruler, was, again, Philip Hatcher, and then he dies. Now, remember, uh, we covered him last time. That's where we left off. Daniel had said that ruler would die, but neither in battle nor in anger. And he did it. His prime minister, a guy named Helen, he ends up poisoning him and killing him in an attempt to gain power. But uh, again, he doesn't gain power uh, because this guy, Antiochus Epiphany, not called that yet, but uh, he, he's able through, again, intrigue and deception to come to the throne. Uh, uh, Philip, Hatter had, uh, Philip Hatter had a brother named Demetrius. He's being held hostage in Rome. Uh, he's got another brother that's in Athens. 
Uh, he's got a son uh, that's only a baby. He's only uh, uh, very, very young, and he's in the city at that time. He's in no position of power. So Antioch, the guy we're talking about, Antiochus, excuse me, uh, uh, he comes on the scene and says, oh, I've been appointed the guardian of Philip Goddard's son. So he needs access to him, he lied, and then, then he, he gets in. Once he's at that point, then he begins to plot and gain power and control. And, the, and with, again, he says, with just few in number, and he plots and has the other brothers in time murdered. So that he eventually, there's no heir. Oh, gee, that's too bad. I guess I'll have to take over and run the empire. So it would make a great, a great movie. If you want to read more about it, this is history. You can go to an encyclopedia, go to Wikipedia, whatever, uh, and read about these guys and, and all the events surrounding his coming to power. So, again, Daniel was correct. He came to power using uh, deceit. And, uh, and when we talk about the fact that, that he is a type of the Antichrist, that's how he will come to power as well. Things that are said, major points about him, uh, we can learn a lot about who the Antichrist is and how he'll come to power as well. Six Antiochus uh, did invade the richest province when they felt secure. Uh, uh, he, uh, he did go down to Egypt when they had peace agreements with the, the Ptolemies who were being ruled by two brothers uh, at that time. He had peace agreements with them, but yet he moved right in and invaded some of their richest provinces and uh, took the wealth from them. And then it says that he achieved what either his father nor his forefathers did and it says he did it by distributing plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. What his forefathers would have done, what the other rulers would do, they conquered somebody, get all the money, eh, take it back to my treasury. He didn't do that. He took it back and distributed it and bought favor with the other regional rulers and paid them off, basically, in order to garner support and, and bolster his own, own position. And, um, and again, he uh, ended up trying to... Uh, uh, create alliances with one of the two brothers in Egypt in order to play them off with each other. A lot of the international intrigue going on here. But that's how he came to power. Verse 25 to 28, the wild king will seek, seek to plunder the south. Verse 25 says, with a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's province, uh, provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away, and many will fall in battle. The two kings, with their hearts bent on evil, will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, because an end will come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it, and then return to his own country. Uh, again, many many specific things that would happen here, uh, Daniel says, but uh, we'll see at least cover uh, three specifics about his seeking plunder in the south, and they are that he would attack the south again, he would sit at a table uh, with the king of the south and <laughs> lie to each other, uh, things haven't changed much, the Middle East uh, peace agreements. Uh, the king of the north will return to his, uh, his own country, uh, but as he does, his heart is turned against the people of the covenant, the Jewish people. Uh, let's look at those uh, and uh, one by one. Uh, Antiochus did attack the, the kings of the south, and uh, uh, he went down there and he was successful in his uh, battles uh, against them. Uh, and uh, he actually was able to uh, take over quite a bit of Egypt, but leave them in power, these two uh, brothers, uh, as kind of uh, his puppets and so forth. Secondly, uh, verse 27, he did sit at the same table with the kings of the south, and, and again, as I mentioned, with one of them uh, to try to set up agreements, uh, how they would rule together and so forth. Now, Antiochus, he had no intention. He wanted to be the king of the whole thing, take the whole thing over. In fact, in the city of Memphis, he had to put a crown on him and say he was the king of Egypt and everything. And so he's there in this peace agreement, lying to his teeth. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, one of the brothers that's there that's negotiating with them is also then uh, he, he's writing Rome uh, and he's uh, uh, he's just striking to deal with the Romans I'll submit to your power I really you guys are on the rise and everything and, uh, and I'll play ball with you if you give me some protection down here against this guy so they're 
at the peace table and they're signing their agreements and we're all going to really get along together and both of them are lying through their feet. That's what Daniel said uh, would happen and that's exactly what continues to happen and, and build these peace uh, uh, agreements uh, uh, you know, right through the history. And the Camp David Accord, Oslo Accord, you can go through them all. Uh, Israel every time signs off, gives up land, gives up this, keeps their agreements, uh, Palestinian Authority, uh, it breaks everyone, doesn't keep their word on any of them, and yet they turn around and have another peace deal, <laughs> as though as though the last one, you know, that didn't go well, well, we'll try it again, we'll give up more land, we'll give up more of this, we'll give up more of that, uh, as though that's gonna, uh, gonna happen. I remember uh, being in Israel a number of years ago, uh, and, uh, and I was at a bot, I saw a teacher in a, a store there, and it showed uh, the Prime Minister uh, at the time, Prime Minister of Israel, kind of cartoon figure of him, and then had an uh, American Indian, you know, with the chief, you know, the headdress on, and they're around the campfire and everything, smoking a peace pipe, and the American Indian, the captain over him, he's saying, and he's saying, trust me, uh, land for peace never work. <laughs> but it, uh, it's never worked for Israel. Uh, they're like these guys here, they continue to uh, lie through their teeth. Here we go, verse 28, the third thing is Antiochus did return to his own country. And it's like, like I said, you think about it, I mean, from where Israel is, straight, you know, the, this is the Mediterranean, straight north is Lebanon, and right over here is Syria, right down here is Jordan, and around Israel, down here, here is Saudi Arabia, and there's Egypt. So every time that they are on their way with their army to Egypt, they go down what was literally called the King's Highway, which ran down through the Mediterranean, uh, the end of the Mediterranean, through Israel, through Jerusalem, so he, he is passing through uh, all these times, and that's why he is disposed of uh, Onias, he's putting Jason in as the high priest, and now on his way back, he finds that uh, Jason isn't quite uh, compromising as much as he would like him to, in fact, he's gathering around him that would say, we don't need these guys ruling over us, we don't need to keep paying them taxes, and his he sees that and he kind of takes a, a firmer control uh, of what's going on uh, there in Jerusalem. Uh, and at that point, his heart has changed, Daniel said, what happened towards the people of the Holy Covenant. There's a hatred that's now brewing uh, against the Jewish people by Antiochus Epiphany. And uh, there'll be more about that. The third thing is the Bible King will invade the South again, this time to his own peril. You see that in verses 29. We just go through half of verse 30. Uh, at the appointed time, you will invade the, uh, the south again, but this time, the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastland will oppose him. He will lose heart. So, four things about this is that he'll invade a second time. It'll have a different outcome. He'll be opposed by ships from the coastland, and he'll lose, lose heart over it. And, and certainly, that's uh, what did happen. Daniel was correct in his predictions. When uh, Antigas did uh, invade uh, Egypt the second time, it's in 168 BC, and um, at this point in time, he is basically a able to overrun and control all of Egypt except for the city of Alexandria, and he was able to capture the island of Cyprus uh, as well. So things seem to be going well, but there is a second invasion with Daniel set. But Daniel said this one would have a different outcome. Last time, he had to get the crown on his head, the city of Memphis, Sign their little peace accords, he goes back home. Uh, this time is different. What's different is that he's opposed by ships uh, from the coastlands. It's the Romans. <laughs> they come down to their ships. And, um, and remember uh, uh, the Ptolemy bros, there's two of them. And one of them's been doing a little letter writing with Rome, right? And so uh, they're, they're pulling those guys into it. And again, the Roman Empire isn't established for another 130 years in terms of the empire. Uh, they're growing powerfully at this point, militarily and, uh, and so forth. And a guy named Gaius Popilius uh, Laenus is, uh, meets him on the beach uh, there and says to uh, Antiochus Epiphany, listen, I'm here from the Senate of Rome, and uh, we want you to cease and desist and go back home with your invasions and so forth. And uh, he says, well, I'll, I'll talk to my counselors and, uh, you know, we'll get back to you on that. And, uh, you know, this is in the historical record. So uh, what this Roman general did then is he drew a line, a circle around him and said, 
before you step out of the circle, you'll be giving your answer. So he decided it would be a good idea at that point to say, I think we're going to cease and desist, and we're just going to go right on back home again. Because he knew if he didn't say that, he'd never make it out of that circle alive. So again, Daniel predicted uh, this opposition, and it would be from this outside source, my shift, which it was. Uh, because of that, then four, very importantly, Antiochus did lose heart. Uh, and so because of that, then, now when he lose heart like he's totally, he's very ticked off and uh, he just conquered all of Egypt and, and lost it a day. He's a little, he's a little upset. And so now he marches back up through Israel and he hits Jerusalem and he's already kind of got a bent or a hatred towards them. He begins to, to take it out on them and that takes us to uh, point four. The vile king will persecute God's people and that's from the second half of verse 30 to verse 35. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those for, who forsake the Holy Covenant. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. But the people who know their God will firmly resist. Those who are wise will instruct many Though for a time they will fall by the sword, or be burned, or captured, or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will come at the appointed time. Uh, I've got just eight specifics to cover here. Uh, the vile king will vent his fury on the, on the people of Israel, the Holy Covenant. The vile king will show favor to anyone that's willing to forsake uh, Israel, uh, the Holy Covenant. He'll uh, come with his armed forces to desecrate the temple, abolish the daily sacrifice, set up an abomination that causes desolation, use flattery to corrupt those who have violated the covenant, persecute the people of God who stand firm. But the people who stand firm will be uh, refined, purified, and, and made spotless until the time of the end. And by the way, the Antichrist will do every one of those things as well. Again, he is not him, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but he is a type. And uh, the way he operates uh, uh, here, this historic figure will be the same for the Antichrist. But let's look at these things. And this is kind of what uh, we know him more about in history, uh, is uh, Antiochus did vent his fury on, on the holy people or the people of God. And he chose the Sabbath or the Shabbat to do it. It says he'll take over the temple by force, and that's what he would do. He comes back up through Jerusalem, and then he replaces the guards of the temple with his own guards. And then he waits to the, to the Sabbath, knowing that the people that were really committed to God would be in there worshiping God in Jerusalem, in the temple, uh, on, on the Sabbath. His whole deal was, was to get people that weren't committed. Uh, and, and less committed, uh, that would compromise uh, to, to be on his, his side. He's looking for the ones that would do things in a multicultural <laughs> way and be pluralistic in their view and not believe that there's one way that leads to God, but many ways to lead to God. It's all sound very familiar. Uh, that's what he's looking for. That's what the Antichrist will be pitching in the future. And we, we kind of see it around us in terms of as a, as a mindset and a philosophy that's already kind of permeating uh, the Western culture. Uh, but here, what he does, he's got the guards there, uh, and so he's got the ones that are really committed, and he knows that the, on, the, on the Shabbat or on the Sabbath, right, uh, we would view them as Orthodox Jews today or ultra-Orthodox, they, they don't do any work, no work, nothing on the Sabbath. So he attacks them. He kills a thousand of them before they figure out whether they should even defend themselves or not, because they're just they're just not sure. That's why the enemies of God, uh, of the Jews, even in uh, modern history, uh, the Yom Kippur War in 1967, uh, you know, Egypt, Syria, uh, they all attack on the most holy day of the year for, for Jews, knowing they're all going to be in Jerusalem, they're all going to be in synagogue, they're all going to be worshiping. And even in that war, it, it took a little bit for a rabbi to stand up and say, it's going to be okay with God if we defend ourselves. There was a little bit of a delay there, even though they were... Uh, they were about ready to, to be uh, in, invaded. And um, 
I mean, again, that, that whole war is a, it's a, a lot of interesting things where God intervened on behalf of the people and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. But uh, here in this case, uh, they were able to, uh, he was able to go in and, again, matching the description of, of uh, Daniel and, uh, and do this, find the ones that were really committed uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and kill them right, right away. <clears throat> and, uh, and other governments had uh, done the same. I um, was going over this, and I was thinking about when, uh, one of the first uh, early trips uh, that we were in Japan. We met uh, uh, one of the, uh, an older lady, uh, gal, that was a, a sister in the Lord that was part of the Calvary Chapel there in West Tokyo. And she was, we were just kind of going around uh, on a Sunday afternoon sharing testimonies. And, and she was talking about the fact that when she was a little girl, her and her mother during the war were placed in internment camps outside of Tokyo because they were Christians. See, the emperor, like Antiochus, the emperor knew that if you were committed to, to uh, faith in Christ, you wouldn't be committed to him. So he didn't trust you. I don't know if you, uh, that kind of blew me away. Uh, in Japan, during the war, they gathered up all the Christians. It's the opposite here. They gathered up all the Christians and put them in internment camps. Now here, conversely, uh, we know there was an internment camp out here in Sand Island and and many uh, in California and uh, in Washington, which was primarily done to rip off the, far the farms from the Japanese farmers. I don't know if you knew that. That's why they did it. They, and they never got their land back. And, uh, but uh, here it was different. Kathy's uh, grandfather uh, was never placed in an internment camp because he was a Christian. And because he, uh, as a Christian, they knew that he had a commitment to Christ and therefore would not be loyal to the emperor. So he could be trusted. That was one of the aspects. I mean, they went, who were leaders in the communities, who would have a voice to other Japanese and so forth. But one of the one of the things that kept him out was him because he was one of the leaders at uh, Benjamin Parker uh, Methodist Church there in, uh, in Kaneohe. But, uh, you know, here, uh, ancient emperors, rulers, modern ones, realized that a commitment to God will keep you from being committed to them. And he goes in and gets those in the, uh, the temple, first of all, kills a thousand of them before they even start to defend themselves. Now, secondly, uh, we see that Antiochus did show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. So there were Jews, along with Jason and so forth, the high priests that were willing to go along and compromise uh, their faith in order to have favor, go along with this guy, uh, and not lose their life over it. And that will be the same thing in the Great Tribulation. A third of the Jews uh, on planet Earth will be saved uh, at the end of the Great Tribulation, but there'll be many that compromise uh, and that go along with the, with the Antichrist. And um, it um, seems amazing to me, you know, I don't get it sometimes, but uh, uh, it's not uh, so much the Jews in uh, Israel, but there's so many against secular Jews around the world that uh, have no, in a sense, religious faith at all, uh, be quite willing to compromise. Uh, three, Antiochus did use armed forces to uh, desecrate the, the temple, as, as I mentioned. He, he set up his own guys as the guards and then, then went in. And I just want to read you a little bit uh, from uh, the book of Maccabees, and I pulled this right out of uh, Wikipedia. Uh, it says here, in terms of this event, uh, quote, as depicted in the book of uh, Maccabees, upon his return from Egypt, Antiochus IV, that's our guy, organized an expedition against Jerusalem, which he destroyed. He put many of its inhabitants to death most, most cruelly. He had uh, soldiers enter the Jewish temple and slaughter a pig, which is impure by the Jew Jewish law, on the altar of the Lord. They set the pig ablaze and then took the meat and tried to make some of the Jewish men eat it. The men refused, and he cut off their tongues, he scalped them, he cut off their hands and their feet, and then he burnt them on the altar of the Lord. This is one of the most evil men that's ever been on the planet. Did I mention he was vile? <laughs> he was vile. You know what? That's like the PG version of what, what happened. But this, this, the description of the events of Antiochus, what he did to the Jewish people during this time, it's uh, horrific. And, uh, and outright uh, murders about 100,000 uh, in, in the process. Uh, again, remember, Daniel is writing what's going to happen to the Jews from the, from the time that he's alive until the time that Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth. He's telling them all in advance what's going to happen. And there's going to be persecution. There's going to be horrific things. But will you, will you follow the Lord? And here's his word. Here's his truth. 
Uh, he's still on the throne. He's still sovereign. It ain't going to be easy. I'm telling you in advance so that you can be faithful to God in the midst of it. I mean, that's the, the purpose of the writing. You know, John's writing ahead of time in advance and uh, telling us things that are going to happen so that uh, we'll be ready uh, so that we can be the watchman on the wall and know what's going on. And that whatever whatever is happening, uh, we'll know that God's word is true and he's still sovereign. But hor horrific times. The fifth thing is Antiochus did set up the abomination that causes desolation. And of course, this was uh, <clears throat> the idea that he took uh, into the Holy of Holies. Again, you have the outer courts, the court of the women, the court of the men, the court of the priests, and then the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant used to be, but it hasn't been there since prior to the Babylonian captivity. Uh, and uh, in that place, their most holy place, and he sets up a, uh, an idol to, uh, to Zeus, an uh, image of Zeus, uh, which what he was trying to do was uh, Greeks had a pantheon of gods, and he said, this is going to be our god, so we're going to make everybody that I rule worship this one god, that's going to bring unity and, uh, and so forth, and he's trying to bring the Jews into this forcibly, he sets that up in the Holy of Holies, and then of course would sacrifice a pig on the, on the literal uh, altar uh, of God that was uh, built and reconstructed by Ezra. You know, when, when he goes back after the Babylonian uh, captivity. Uh, again, to put it in New Testament terms, the reason that Herod built his temple is because this temple is so destroyed and desecrated by Antiochus Epiphany. So that's why we have a big, grand, glorious temple by the time Jesus comes on the scene uh, in, in the first century. Now, the other thing this, I just want to make clear is that, and we'll talk about this again as we close, this is an abomination that causes desolation. It is not the abomination that causes desolation. Uh, again, what he does is horrific, but Jesus would tell us in Matthew, Matthew 24 that in the future, there will be the abomination that causes desolation, spoken by the prophet Daniel. So this is, this is an it. This is it in type, but this is an it, according to Jesus. I mean, we mention that again as we did last week at the close, because 75% of the people in the world today that call themselves Christians, all the Reformed churches, uh, Anglican, all the Presbyterian, all the Lutheran, all the Roman Catholics, and I'm saying using that term, all the 75% of the people that call themselves Christians uh, uh, believe that all of Daniel 11 has already been fulfilled completely and that Antiochus Epiphany was the Antichrist and this was the abomination that causes desolation. But Jesus is really mixed up in his time frame and his words, if that were true. And he says it's still yet future. He's only a time. Uh, six, Antiochus uh, did use flattery to corrupt those who violated the covenant. As I mentioned, many Jews did compromise, uh, as there will be those during the tribulation. Seven, Antiochus did persecute the people of God who stood firm. And uh, the guys that stood firm are, are those that were the followers of Judas Maccabeus. That wasn't his real last name. That was the last name he took, which meant the hammer. That was like a WWF guy. Judas the hammer. That, that literally is the name that, that he took. And uh, these guys basically said, uh, we're outnumbered and we may die trying. Well, we're not going to, we're not going along with this. And what they did is some were able to escape to, uh, to the mountains, to the Judea hills and so forth. And then basically using guerrilla warfare tactics, even though at times they attacked with stones and sticks. And they would attack small groups of Syrian soldiers and then capture their weapons, retreat back again. Find another small patrol, attack again. Uh, this went on for uh, a number of years. And uh, Judas, along with his... Uh, his, uh, his brother, Simeon, and others, he's eventually killed in battle, but they continue on. And eventually, uh, certainly with God's help, they're able to drive the Syrians out of, out of uh, Israel. Now, uh, if you're Jewish, I mean, you, you think about uh, uh, David, the great warrior, and Joab, the great warrior. You talk about Moses. You talk about, uh, uh, you know, Samson. And you talk about Judas Maccabeus. He, he's right up there with everybody else because of what the Jewish people were going through and what he was able to do against against all, all odds. And obviously, as I mentioned, gave him his life doing. 
what happens then, they then go in and set up what's called the Hashmonian uh, uh, Empire. Israel is independent as a nation for just a little brief window of a time, maybe 100 years at the max, and that sets the stage for the Romans to come in and, and eventually uh, completely take over and rule Israel as a puppet state, which was the case when, uh, when Jesus comes on uh, the scene. And of course, when we covered some of this last time in Daniel 8, uh, it's through that process that, that we have the uh, Festival of Lights or the Feast of Dedication or what referred to as Hanukkah that Jesus observed. Jesus goes to and observes the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah in John uh, chapter 10 because once the temple was uh, was needed to be cleansed, they had enough olive oil to light the menorah, which had to be done so they could cleanse the temple. Uh, they only had enough oil for one day and uh, it would take uh, you know, seven more days to, to make more oil that would be refined enough for that purpose. And they just trusted somehow <clears throat> God would forgive them, but they needed to cleanse the temple, so they lit the menorah, and they were just going to do it as long as they could. And, uh, but uh, God miraculously caused the menorah to burn for, uh, for eight days, even though it only had enough oil for one. So Jews around the world and all early Christians, all early Christians celebrated Hanukkah you know that Christmas has only been around for a couple hundred years? <laughs> that, that, that's why George Washington was able to attack on Christian Day. It's because they were all the Puritan Pilgrim guys. They're fighting the Anglican, uh, you know, who had more of a Roman Catholic theology, Roman Catholicism. And this is like free, because it was not even in my notes. <laughs> Roman Catholicism dreamt up uh, Christmas uh, so they could tie it in with the winter soldiers, because they kept trying to be very pluralistic and appeal to the, the cults and the uh, false religions around them. They did that. It carries over into England, to the Church of England or the Anglican Church. But the, uh, the, the back to the Bible guys, the Puritans, the Pilgrims, and all that, they never bought into bringing pagan holidays into uh, a Christian context. So all the early Christians celebrated Hanukkah. Uh, and uh, so that's why on December 25th, uh, Washington, you know, crosses the Delaware, the famous picture of him, and attacks the British troops. Why? Because they're all celebrating Christmas, and they could—they don't care that it's Christmas because they don't celebrate it. And they—they—they they, they won the day and caught them by, by surprise. So it was only uh, as um, boy, I'm really giving you way too much information. But as our country became more industrialized, people moved in off the farms. They—they they saw the city lights, and they saw some people with Christmas trees. And what's that all about? Why did they do that? And, that looks like fun. And then it eventually kind of caught on as a American cultural thing. But um, uh, initially, the church celebrated Hanukkah, just lighting those candles and remember how God miraculously intervened to cause the oil to last seven days, but that was only symbolic of, of God's faithfulness in a time when they were persecuted and oppressed. He raised up a deliverer. And again, the middle candle is the shamash, or the servant, which is, again, typical of Jesus. He's the light of the world. He is the servant that came to save us from our sins. So the early Christians went, Jesus, he's the light of the world, and they would light their, their Hanukkah candles. Okay. We better really move on. <laughs> no. Five. The vile king is, uh, is a type of the Antichrist, and we kind of mentioned that and clarified that uh, this was an abomination that caused desolation. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 15. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, let, then let those who are in Judea flee uh, to the mountains. So Jesus says, that event, only in time. Daniel who predicted it, yeah, there was Antiochus Epiphany, Jesus was well aware of that, but he says it's future. There's going to be a future temple. He says this one's going to be destroyed. In the future, there'll be one built. And um, man, when you see that abomination, the Antichrist, in the middle of that tribulation period, come in and, and um, set up the image of himself and declare himself to be God in the daily sacrifices and so forth. Then he says to the Jewish people that are there, get out of town. <laughs> Don't go back and get a cloak. Pray that it's not on the Sabbath. Uh, or in winter, and uh, head for those Judean hills, which uh, which many obviously will do, and they'll be saved as a result. Um, again, so 
what we learned, some of the things about the Antichrist from Antiochus, that he'll come to power using deceit. He will invade and destroy Egypt, just like this one will. He, he will do that in the future. He'll desecrate Israel, he'll persecute the Jewish people, and he will claim to be uh, God. But uh, again, Paul tells us uh, in 2 Thessalonians, we read this last week, but just a reminder, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawless is revealed. The man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself uh, to be God. So he is yet future, and he'll be the subject of our Christmas message. No. We'll go right into him next week, and then the following week we'll finish chapter 12 and probably have a a couple of weeks at uh, looking at the birth of Christ as we head toward uh, towards Christmas. Again, 135 specific prophecies uh, that are fulfilled. And uh, and the reason that we, we study it is because, and it's good to know, because through it we understand in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the transmission of God's word is absolutely accurate, therefore we can trust it. God, it's a proof that God exists because he lives outside of time and space had to be able to see the end from the beginning, to speak these things to Daniel, uh, again, hundreds of years before they uh, were fulfilled. And obviously, he's not the only one. When Christ came, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies just in his his birth, his life, and his death, uh, and his resurrection. But uh, let me read to you, I've kind of been uh, uh, kind of touched by this verse in uh, Romans 15, uh, 4, uh, that I think is uh, can be relevant to us. Therefore, it says, for everything that was written in the past, that's what we've just been studying. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. Therefore, we should study it because it's written to teach us. So that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, uh, we might have hope. Uh, even in our lives, there are times when, man, we just got to tough it out. Uh, difficult uh, situations uh, going on economically, relationship-wise, health-wise, whatever it, uh, it might be. Uh, how do we do that? How do we have endurance through the encouragement of the scriptures that were written in the past uh, in order to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we have what a lot of people don't have today, we have hope. And uh, you know, especially I think during the holiday season, it's such a joyous time for believers who are celebrating Christ's birth and uh, despite the, uh, the initial reason for it being brought into the church, just don't bow down and worship any of those little green trees in your house and you'll be all right. Because uh, that's where they came from. And, uh, but uh, uh, we can, uh, you know, celebrate Christmas and hear those Christmas worship songs being uh, going on in the mall and uh, just think, man, <laughs> praise God, we, we know the scene here. Uh, Gabby was uh, somewhere yesterday and she uh, met, uh, met a gal and, and she was all excited because she says, this is my first Christmas as a Christian. And, uh, you know, you know how, how great that, that is, uh, that uh, you have the, uh, the hope that we're, we're talking about this time of year. I remember one of the uh, early trips with the, uh, with the kids and we were in China. It was close to Christmas. It was about that first week in December. We're walking in the hotel and they're playing Christmas music. You know, because to them, it's just Western music. It's what they listen to at this time of year. Of course, they don't have a concept or understand English necessarily. And, but it was just such a contrast to hear the praises of God being declared in a place where lots of people have no hope. And very difficult for them to hear the gospel. Uh, but hey, these things are written uh, to give us a, a bearing uh, in life. I just wanted to uh, close in uh, this uh, kind of a quote from an article by Kenton uh, Anderson. Uh, he was talking about going to the Royal Observatory in uh, Greenwich, England, where the uh, Prime Meridian is. What the Prime Meridian is, is that 1884, we have the council decide, we're going to put a line of the dirt right here. And everything on that side is the Eastern Hemisphere, and everything up here is the Western Hemisphere field, so that we can kind of uh, get our clocks jiving here a little bit. Because at that time, every region had their own time. You can, that'd be a little confusing today. Uh, you know, and uh, in Poland and, and uh, you know, Hungary had different times. And, uh, you know, first we realized California's been on a different time zone than everybody else for many years. But, you know, there would be different times uh, uh, around the world. So they, they make this determination, but they make it based on 
uh, the work of an astronomer uh, named uh, John of Flancy. He's the guy that basically looked at the stars, located them, named them, and locked them in as navigational points. Uh, even your little GPS works, it's, they have to have something to calibrate that from. There had to be some fixed points uh, somewhere to make that uh, work. Uh, and he kind of had fun with it. He said he took uh, a couple of his kids and put them on the eastern hemisphere and a couple on the western hemisphere, both sides of the line. It's carved in the cement and took a picture of them and so forth. But uh, listen to what he says uh, about the experience. Uh, and he mentions that the astronomer, uh, John uh, Flanagan. Eventually, based on Flanagan's work, scientists were able to help people find a position on the planet allowing them to answer that fundamental question of philosophy and physics. Where am I? The power of the prime meridian is that it's a fixed position through which our knowledge of time and place can be understood. This is a metaphor for the effect of the Bible in human life. The scripture is our meridian. It's a fixed position given by God himself through which we can understand who we are, where we are, and where we must go from here. And, uh, and that's why it is under attack. And so we can be so thankful for the prophecies in the Bible, in particular the, the specifics of Daniel and the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because that is the argument. When was it written? Well, based on science, it can tell you one thing, it's older than 200 BC, and, and most of these events occur after that time. And there's no way to explain that apart from God's intervention. And so we can Again, trust God's word. It becomes the, the anchor of, of our life because it's not going to shift. It's not going to move in time. Cultural values and, and mores and all that change. They used to change generationally, sociologists tell us. Now they change every 10 years. What, what a culture values is, is true and good and beautiful versus evil and mean and, uh, and, and so forth. That used to, those values used to change generationally a little. They say they're changing every 10 years now. So what is good is no longer good. What used to be evil is now held up in, in high esteem. Uh, it's just the days we're living in, but the Bible hasn't changed. And uh, therefore, we've got something to tell us uh, who we are and where we are and where we're going from here.